My name is John Morris, and uh, I'm the director of the Knight Alzheimer's Disease Research Center uh, here at Washington University School of Medicine. So here are my uh, disclosures. Um, and when we're discussing the Knight Alzheimer's Disease Research Center, uh, recognize that it began, its antecedents began in 1979 with something called the Memory and Aging Project. And it first had a center designation when it was awarded a, a P50 grant in 1985. So we've been around in one form or another a long time. Uh, I arrived in 1982 and uh, 1983 uh, joined what became the, uh, became the center. And I'll just uh, indicate that this is the state of the ADRC. Well, one of the states of the ADRC is we've gotten bigger. Here we were in 1991. Uh, I'm standing next to uh, the founding director, Leonard Berg. I think you'll appreciate uh, that uh, Gene Rubin is standing next to me, and two people to his right is Terry Hosto. And then in the front row, uh, kneeling uh, on the left, is, is Mary Coates. Everyone else has gone on to another position or has retired. But that was the size of our clinical operation uh, back uh, almost 25 years ago. So compare that with uh, this. And you can see that we've really uh, increased our uh, capacity in terms of investigators and staff. And we're very interdisciplinary. Uh, our faculty uh, come from 20 different departments or schools here at Washington University, including uh, several on the Danforth uh, campus. So we're not exclusively School of Medicine. And of course, we uh, couldn't uh, do our work without uh, our volunteer participants. And we have about 900 volunteer participants uh, who, uh, as a group, are extremely uh, dedicated and committed. We're very thankful to all of them. Of course, we will have people who uh, we uh, uh, can um, recruit to fill positions. Uh, and within, uh, since the last state of the ADRC, we have uh, Becky. Uh, Cusinelli and Nicole Elmore uh, joining our staff as, uh, as uh, part of our nursing uh, clinician group. And Nicole is a uh, nurse practitioner. Uh, Sonia uh, Kalathavidal is here to join our nascent uh, clinical trials unit. Justin Long is in his final week of neurology residency here. And on July uh, 1st, will become our new night uh, ADRC a fellow, postdoctoral fellow. Uh, and uh, Connie Mayo is another a nurse clinician who has joined us. And our most recent uh, new arrival is Anastasia Anazanwu, who is a psychometrician. Uh, we're losing some people, or have lost some people. So Cole Bolton is a psychometrician who's going to go on to graduate school in August. Ji Young Han. Uh, has been our uh, Knight ADRC postdoctoral fellow for the past two years and has just begun her uh, residency training at the University of Massachusetts uh, Worcester. She uh, had completed neurology residency in South Korea, uh, but uh, wants to uh, continue to stay in the States and so is doing a second American uh, neurology residency. Tim Holden. Uh, uh, began as a uh, Knight uh, ADRC postdoctoral fellow last August and will be with us through the, uh, through the month of July. But uh, September 1, uh, he will be appointed to the faculty here at Washington University in the Division of uh, Geriatrics uh, in the Department of Medicine. And Angela Oliver, a longtime uh, nurse clinician, has moved to another position here at the medical school. Now, I have some. Uh, pet issues, or some people might say pet e uh, peeves. One of them is the use of apostrophe S in eponyms. An eponym, of course, is a name or phrase that includes the name of a person, such as Down syndrome, or a place, such as Lyme disease, to indicate an illness. And there are over 7,000 eponyms in the medical literature. It uh, can often be used without an apostrophe S, the non-possessive form, 
but often is used as a possessive form. I've illustrated Down's syndrome versus Down syndrome. And older usage tended to be possessive. However, the governing uh, agencies, uh, including the NIH, the World Health Organization, and the American Medical Association, have for decades suggested that we not use the possessive form, the apostrophe S, avoid the misconception that the persons whose name um, uh, is indicated had that illness, that's very rarely the case, or that they possessed that illness, that's not the case either. Uh, so we, uh, th these recommendations to use the non-possessive form is to promote consistency in scholarly writing and in medical education. So I'm championing the use of the term Alzheimer disease rather than Alzheimer's disease. So please join me with that. There are other common uh, uh, usages that I think we need to be more consistent in doing. Uh, the first is uh, our research volunteers are not subjects, they're not the focus of something that we're doing to them, but there are partners in trying to understand Alzheimer's disease, so use the term participants. Uh, DAT is dementia of the Alzheimer type. That has been outmoded since 2011, so use the term Alzheimer's disease dementia, not DAT. Uh, again, the apostrophe, when uh, you use the apostrophe, it's either a contraction or a possessive form. So when we're talking about a person in her 60s, we don't use the apostrophe. It's, she's in her 60s. Uh, Mr. and Mrs. Uh, Charles F. Knight uh, do not appreciate the abbreviation KADRC. For night ADRC, they prefer night ADRC, so please don't abbreviate K ADRC. And then mild cognitive impairment. Um, you know that we strive, both in our clinical work in the Memory Diagnostic Center and certainly in our research work, to try to determine the etiology of whatever the cognitive impairment uh, is due to. So let's not use a syndromic term, MCI, which doesn't denote etiology, but use a etiologic term and give the degree of severity as operationalized by the CDR. So I was surprised. I went to our night ADRC uh, page in the NAC a data set, the National Alzheimer Coordinating Center, and I found that 9% of our research participants are entered into NAC as having MCI, 83 out of uh, all the impaired individuals there. And I was, um, as I said, surprised, so once again, I'm going to make a uh, plea that we use the dementia severity using the CDR and the, to the best of our ability, the underlying etiology rather than the term MCI. Now, why am I going on about this? Uh, <clears throat> as I say, uh, MCI is a syndromic a classification. I think it did have a purpose to identify the earliest symptomatic stages of the illness or the illnesses that cause dementia. But increasingly, it's been recognized that clinical and biomarker use can identify the underlying cause of whatever is causing the mild cognitive impairment. So the term was revised in 2011 to, to attribute an etiologic term, MCI due to Alzheimer's disease. Now the criteria uh, from 2011 for MCIs, there has to be some change in cognition. And this is something I, the second point of cri uh, criterion I, I don't agree with have to have objective impairment in one or more cognitive domains, and that typically means that a person has to perform more poorly on a standard cognitive measure than his or her peers, age and education match. And we think all, all of us have had cases, uh, patients as well as participants, 
who were very highly educated or very intellectually endowed, who have changed but still test uh, well so that they don't demonstrate objective impairment. And so I think that there should be intra-individual decline rather than comparing to normative data inter-individual comparisons. But the big issue is this independence and functional activities. That always was the distinction between MCI and dementia. Uh, and, and so uh, criterion three and four are really the same. You have to be independent in functional activities if you're for MCI. If you're independent, then you can't be demented because demented requires functional impairment. But upon reading these revised criteria from 2011, they actually accept people who are functionally impaired. People can have problems in their instrumental activities of daily living, and they may require assistance to perform their activities. So that no longer is independence, even though that's one of the criterion. Uh, in fact, they permit uh, dependence, impaired ability to perform everyday activities. And that means dementia. So this, now the distinction between dementia and MCI is artificial, and it's not surprising that it's hard to distinguish these two, it's an arbitrary decision in my opinion, if the underlying diagnosis, the disease process, is the same. Of course, not all people with very mild impairment have Alzheimer's disease, just as people with more advanced impairment, not everyone has Alzheimer's disease. But we can determine in many cases when Alzheimer's disease is the cause, and we should so term it. So, MCI would be the earliest symptomatic stage of Alzheimer's disease. And that's how I've continued to present this in scholarly articles. I use the term symptomatic Alzheimer's disease, and then I clarify this encompasses both MCI due to Alzheimer's disease as well as Alzheimer's disease dementia. All right, enough lecturing. Okay, what are the themes of the Knight Alzheimer's Disease Research Center. Well, we're interested in the use of biomarkers to identify Alzheimer's disease prior to the symptomatic stage, before there are any symptoms, MCI or otherwise. And to do that, we ask our research participants to undergo longitudinal biomarker assessments, both imaging and fluid, particularly cerebrospinal fluid. We're, we ask some questions. Will all older adults who demonstrate uh, preclinical Alzheimer's disease, should they continue to live, develop symptomatic Alzheimer's disease? We don't know the answer to that. We've been doing the biomarker study since about 2005, and we know that the preclinical stage can last 20 years or longer, so we don't have enough follow-up to be able to answer that. And if if people will transition to symptomatic Alzheimer's disease from preclinical Alzheimer's disease, can we characterize that transition period? Because this would be important as we are trying to develop new paradigms of uh, clinical trials to prevent symptomatic Alzheimer's disease. All right, so uh, just to... Um, be um, clear about how we get our funding. Uh, we, are, we see our research participants at the Memory and Aging Project, the entity that Leonard Berg and his colleagues developed in 1979. And their participation and the procedures that they undergo are supported by grants from the National Institute on Aging. Three large grants and then, uh, then the uh, Alzheimer's Disease Research Center grant that started in 1985 and was endowed in 2010. <clears throat> the Healthy Aging and Senile Dementia Program Project Grant, which began in 1984. The Adult Children Study, which began in 2005. And then the most recent grant, the Dominantly Inherited Alzheimer Network, that began in 2008. Now, I think everyone here is aware <clears throat> that grants are awarded for a budget period of five years and if we continue to have scientific questions that these clinical studies can address, we must reapply every five years for another five-year budget period. And that undergoes a competitive review, and there's no assurance that the grants will be renewed. 
We've been remarkably fortunate, thanks to all of you, the tremendous faculty and staff, as well as our committed participants, to have each of our renewals rewarded since, 19, since we began our grant application process in 1984. So that's a, a real tribute, I think, to the Knight uh, ADRC. Now, I bring that up with some trepidation because we just submitted another grant. and We don't know if it's going to get renewed or not. Uh, it, we'll find out in a couple of months. It went in in January for the program project Healthy Aging and Senile Dementia, and we have our fingers crossed for hopefully a fundable score. Uh, having these grants is, um, again, a, a, a remarkable uh, <clears throat> uh, characteristic of the Knight ADRC, but it also means that we're often in grant writing mode. So we spent the last part of 2017 preparing the HASD renewal application that was submitted in 2018. Uh, we're now uh, working to submit a renewal application for the Diane study. That will be due September 2018. We've already started planning a renewal for the ADRC grant. That will be due May of 2019. And following that, it's time for the adult children's study. A grant to be renewed. So we're continually in grant writing mode. We've begun planning for the ADRC renewal, and it's going to be a different application than we have had. Uh, there will be no more science projects uh, of the R01 type supported by this grant, nor will there be ADRC pilot grants. Instead, we'll have developmental grants that will be for a longer period than the ADRC pilot, but not as long as the R01 period, and will be a higher budget than the current ADRC pilots, but not as much as an R01. But these are supposed to help launch a project and get uh, sufficient traction that uh, uh, can apply for an R01 or another mechanism to continue the study. Also, uh, when we go in with our application next year, the request for uh, applications, RFA, for all ADRCs now uh, in, uh, require that we have a focus on non-Alzheimer dementia. You'll see that's a problem for us. I'll show you shortly why that is so. But the idea is that we should be addressing uh, the co-pathologies that almost certainly contribute to a disease heterogeneity and identify multiple factors, not just Alzheimer's disease, for many of the late life dementing illnesses. So we have to be broader in our scope. We also are required to address the National Alzheimer Prevention Act goals and milestones. They're listed here. I don't think we'll have a problem with that. We're encouraged to have collaborations with other related initiatives other centers here at Washington University School of Medicine or outside, including other eight Alzheimer's disease centers. Our research, another requirement is our research should inform our clinical practice and vice versa. So we have to identify how that is done. And we will need to indicate how we re request input from our participants in the research studies that we are doing. Some new wrinkles as well in the renewal application that we'll submit a year from now is there's a new component called research education component uh, that uh, covers uh, uh, responsibilities now under our uh, outreach um, recruitment and education core. So this new component will be led uh, by Joy Snyder and Susie Stark. We're very pleased about that. We're also required to have a biomarker core. This is problematic for us since we have a biomarker core for fluids funded in the adult children's study and we have an imaging biomarker core funded through the HASD uh, grant. So we can't ask for funds uh, to do what we're already uh, been provided funds to do. So we need a new core and 
uh, we're going to have a stem cell core that uh, will be led by Celeste Karch. Uh, we've already met with uh, each core leader to review the RFA, so everyone is aware of these new requirements and new organizations. And just uh, totaling up our core leaders throughout all of our grants, we now have uh, six women who are leading cores, which is, which is terrific. We presented our plans for, to, for our renewal to our external advisory committee a month ago, and they approved it. And we've been meeting as a, as a group to plan our uh, application. The first meeting was in, uh, earlier this month. So here's a snapshot of our participants. So right now we're seeing about 893 participants. Not most of them are seen annually, not everyone. Uh, the younger uh, Diane and adult children study participants come in every two or three years. But if we look at our older adult clinical cohorts, that would be our uh, Healthy Aging and Senile Dementia Program Project and our ADRC cohorts together they're 65 and older, they're about 500 such individuals. The adult children's study is 45 years and older. And uh, when we put this slide together, it was 294, we're slightly over 300 now. And Diane is uh, 18 and older. Uh, globally, in all Diane sites, there are 530 Diane participants. Uh, about 20% are uh, here at this single site at Washington University, and that's been led by Randy Bateman. When we include our Diane participants, this is the age range of the individuals who we see as research participants, so we're really studying Alzheimer's disease throughout the adult lifespan. 57% of our participants are women. 16% are African American. Uh, one currently has just completed his 30th year of participation, and two others are right behind at 29 years. So it's pretty remarkable. And they come not just from Missouri and Illinois, but from uh, far away states as well. And they're, as I said, very dedicated, very committed. Here is the, um, the demographic features of the people who are 65 and older. And I mentioned the adult children's study sees people 45 and up. We began that study in 2005, so some of those individuals now have gone past age 65. So if we include them, we have a total of about 640 people who are 65 and older. 500 of them are cognitively normal. That's, that's I think, 78%. And this is a, a problem. Now, that, this represents the focus of our ADRC. We're looking at preclinical Alzheimer's disease. People who are cognitively normal, but have the biomarker evidence of Alzheimer's disease. So the sample reflects our research, but it leaves us with only 22% of individuals who are in the very mildest symptomatic stages of Alzheimer's disease. And this is the focus uh, in this, these mild symptomatic stages are the focus of many other investigators that want to use our research cohort. We don't have so many. And it becomes very problematic to try to fulfill each investigator's request, particularly for individuals in the symptomatic stage. So this is something that we've given a lot of thought to, how we can address this. And, and I will tell you it's not represented here that of the symptomatic individuals, the CDR 0.5 and CDR 1, are almost exclusively people with symptomatic Alzheimer's disease. So remember the new RFA for the Alzheimer's centers is we have to look at multiple pathologies. So we're going to have to address that as well. <clears throat> we do well among other uh, Alzheimer's disease centers, at least we've been around a long time, and we've, uh, we're six in the number of participants submitted to the National Alzheimer Coordinating Center, we would be number one if we had included our adult children's study people, but since they're not seen annually, they're really not eligible for NAC. But we would be leading the pack if we included the adult, if we got full credit for all of the participants who we see. Now here's something that isn't so pleasant to discuss. There are 31 Alzheimer's disease centers 
you see the rates of missed appointments at follow-up session one, follow-up session two, follow-up session three, four, and five, it averages about 20% across all centers. 80% of their participants come back for their follow-up assessments. Compare with ours. It's not only higher, it's increasing the further we go. And this is a major issue. Many of you have heard us talk about this and have talked with us about this, about the burden that we place on our participants for all, because they are so committed, dedicated, and do such great work and are well phenotyped, have imaging and fluids and cognitive assessments, lots of people would like to study them. And so they get asked to do many things and they simply can't do it all. And I think these missed follow-up rates reflect participant burden. Of course, it affects our science. Um, Kenji will, Zhang and uh, our D data management and statistics core will uh, verify that missing data, the biggest concern about trying to uh, accomplish our scientific goals. And we're not funded for extra assessments. So if people miss an assessment or our participants miss an assessment and they come later to get another assessment, we don't have funding for that. We do it, but we don't have funding for that. And so it's a big problem for us to understand uh, this participant burden and try to reduce it. Now, on the other hand, <coughs> our participants, of course, are all volunteers, and they can decide at any time what they want to do or what they don't want to do. We can't force them to do this. And <coughs> many are older and have uh, consequences that prevent them from coming. We understand this. They become ill or their spouse becomes ill or people die. But if you look at it again, for the first three months of 2018, we had 260 assessment slots that we were funded to perform, but we um, lost 74 of those. We only completed 186. So we've lost those slots and we've lost the data particularly bad when we have a cancellation on Saturday mornings because everyone comes in just to do that assessment, not for other work. Here are the reasons our participants give for cancellation. They don't say, I've been asked to do too much. They haven't said that. Now, in Susie Stark's, uh, I'll get to in just a moment what we're doing. Susie Stark and others are doing a survey of this, and we ask about burden there. But these are the reasons they've given us so far. They've had health problems, health issues, or they're busy, or they can't get here. Sometimes it's weather, sometimes they forget. So we're, what are we doing about this? Well, one, we're trying to understand the reasons for participant burden and what our participants tell us would help them. This is a funded study, uh, Susie Stark at Washington University, Jennifer Lingler at the uh, University of Pittsburgh, Dorothy Edwards at the University of Wisconsin have developed this uh, survey and it's in progress now. There may be a fourth site if it's funded at uh, University of California, uh, Irvine. So that's one thing, trying to understand what our participants want and what they don't like about us. But from psychiatry, Dr. Sarah Hartz and Dr. Jessica Mazursky have just completed a pilot study with 20 of our participants in which uh, we developed a protocol where Dr. Hartz, at the completion of a person's visit here to do psychometric testing, would have an opportunity to get their brain, most recent brain MRI uh, images shown to them in a copy of the uh, radiology report. Uh, and so this is something that our participants have told us, that they would like to have their research results available to them. And uh, so this was an initial study really to see how we might implement that, because it takes time, <clears throat> both participant time, but certainly clinician time, as well as some understanding to be able to discuss this and show what is normal and what might be abnormal and to discuss the implications. So, this has just been completed, and <clears throat> Sarah and Jessica are uh, writing that up. And <clears throat> what we found is that they approached 25 participants, 23 were interested, so 92%, very interested in getting their brain MRI results. 
<clears throat> and we completed 20. And we found that in order to do this in an in a unhurried fashion and to allow questions and answers, this needs to be a separate session. So it's going to take time to deliver research results, but it can be done. So that's what we've accomplished so far. Uh, and <clears throat> we'll uh, see if they're able to be funded to do this in a more intense way with additional uh, research results and additional participants. So back to our theme, we are a biomarker study, preclinical Alzheimer's disease. Our participants are asked to do many things. So we've decided to develop a new enrichment strategy for new participants. At baseline, all eligible participants will undergo their standard clinical assessment, their uh, psychometric assessment, cognitive assessment, they'll get a blood draw, for uh, our genetic core, they'll get a brain MRI and an amyloid PET. If they're amyloid PET positive, they'll all be entered 100% into what we call our longitudinal cohort, which is essentially what we're doing now. That is, people will come annually for their clinical and cognitive assessments. They'll get spinal taps, blood draws, PET imaging for tau and amyloid, brain MRI. They'll participate in the sleep project, they'll participate in new projects, including remote cognitive assessment using a smartphone. So everyone who is amyloid positive, or if they're am African American, regardless of their amyloid PET results, they'll all go into the longitudinal cohort. If at baseline they are amyloid PET negative, a portion of those individuals will go into the longitudinal cohort, so not everybody that we accept from here on out into the longitudinal cohort will be amyloid PET positive. But a large number of them will go into something we're calling the complementary cohort. So these are people who will not, at least at this time, will not be studied longitudinally, but they will have the baseline clinical assessment, the baseline imaging, the genetic work, and they can be a reservoir of participants for other studies that don't require uh, amyloid positivity and help alleviate the, the uh, work uh, of our longitudinal cohort. So they'll be available as a, uh, as a research-ready cohort. Okay, so just continuing about the participant burden, we shoot for um, uh, Completion of amyloid PET and brain MRI of 80% and for lumbar puncture for cerebral spinal fluid of 70%. Here is our scorecard for the past three years. We're under these goals, targets. And matter of fact, uh, amyloid imaging is, uh, uh, we have fewer amyloid PET scans these years than we had lumbar punctures. But if we look at follow-up PET scans, uh, this is uh, about two-thirds of our participants have had at least one, whereas fewer than half have had follow-up lumbar puncture. Now, this is for all of our participants. We know we can do better. Perhaps our most dedicated cohort are the adult children's study. And here, when we look just at that group, we see that they complete their amyloid PET scans, their lumbar puncture, their brain MRI, other studies at a very high rate. The nine-year group is down somewhat, and we're concerned about that, but it's a, a remarkable longitudinal biomarker cohort that, with high completion rates. We don't require at time of enrollment that people agree to donate their brain when they're finished using it. But we ask that they consider that, and last year was a very good year. We had 92 percent, uh, just people enrolled in the ADRC grant, 92 percent uh, completion of autopsies, our autopsy rate was 92 percent, included five autopsies in people who are CDR zero and uh, in the only African American who came to autopsy. When we look at the ADRC and HASD cohorts combined last year, we still had a high rate, 81 percent, and compared to all other Alzheimer's centers, uh, their rate, uh, the mean rate is 58 percent. 
and we had uh, six uh, autopsies in CDR0 participants and a 75% autopsy rate in African Americans. And this is telling, because you can see the African American autopsy rate across all ADCs is 22%. The ADRC is uh, um, large and, th and has many people, and people have been around for periods of time, and so there are inevitable transitions. Uh, Krista Mulder is uh, now the executive director for the three grants for which I am the principal investigator, ADRC, HASD, and ACS. Virginia Buckles, who has been uh, with me in our program since 1992, uh, has uh, begun a, a part-time position, so she stepped down as the executive director last summer, but still is planning, is still uh, very active and uh, is coming uh, three days a week now, uh, but she plans to uh, retire full-time about a year from now. Uh, Nigel Cairns will retire at the end of August of this year. He's been with us for 14 years. We're fortunate that uh, Nigel has been working with Rick Perrin from the Division of Neuropathology, and Rick became the HASD core leader uh, in December of last year and went in on our HASD renewal application as the neuropathology core leader. And once Nigel steps down at the end of August, he'll uh, take over uh, Nigel's other leadership positions. Very pleased that uh, Greg Day from the Department of Neurology is now the Associate Clinical Core Leader for the Knight Alzheimer's Disease Research Center, uh, Healthy Aging, Senile Dementia, and Adult Children's Study Clinical Cores, and that Eric McDade is the Associate Clinical Core Leader for uh, the Diane Observational Study. I remain the core leader for those four grants, but it's great to have Greg and Eric taking on uh, 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 these uh, additional leadership roles. Number of um, accomplishments uh, have happened to the Knight ADRC uh, faculty in this past year. Bo Ansis was installed in February as the Daniel J. Brennan, MD, Professor of Neurology. And Jin Mu Lee, also from the Department of Neurology, became the Norman J. Stupp Professor of Neurology. The Stupp Professorship is the oldest professorship here at the School of Medicine that was uh, developed uh, for Alzheimer's disease uh, investigators. Randy Bateman remains the Knight Distinguished Professor of Neurology and uh, another uh, uh, professorship, endowed professorship developed uh, for Alzheimer's disease, the Char Charlotte and Paul Hageman Professor of Neurology is held by Dave Holtzman and I remain the Friedman Distinguished Professor of Neurology. Uh, <clears throat> we have really a remarkable group of junior faculty, uh, early stage investigators and they merit uh, uh, recognition. Uh, some of them were recognized uh, recently, and I'll tell you about the Poletsky Award, uh, which is our oldest uh, award to recognize uh, uh, individuals of high promise for a career in uh, dementia and aging research. And we had two recipients this uh, last year, Ji Young Han, our, our former fellow who now is in Massachusetts, and Stephanie Schultz, who's working with us in the Imaging Corps. Uh, the Coppolo Award uh, also is a, a well-established award, and uh, this year, Greg Day was the recipient, and we are fortunate to uh, inaugurate a new uh, award to recognize uh, people of great promise, and uh, the Blumenfeld Award uh, began this year, and the awardee was Suzanne, is Suzanne Schindler. More honors. Um, the highly cited researchers, um, we had five of our faculty so listed. Chris Carpenter from Emergency Medicine was uh, given a, an award, recognizes his efforts for trying to uh, address the um, proper care and assessment of geriatric individuals in the emergency department. Uh, Nupur Goshal and Justin Long were honored by the neurology residents for their teaching. Justin is going to be the new postdoctoral fellow in July. Ron Gregory, who is here with us from our African American Advisory Board, was inducted into the National Black Marathoners Association Hall of Fame. And Dave Holtzman is our current president of the American Neurologic Association. Uh, 
in May, I was uh, privileged to give the Leon Thal Memorial Lecture at Banner Health System in Phoenix, and then this month, the Alan Roses uh, Symposium Keynote uh, at uh, Duke University. Jason Ulrich uh, has been uh, uh, awarded the Vision Award at the Charleston Conference on Alzheimer's Disease, and Kenji Zhang is uh, Faculty of, Ye of the Year in the Division of Biostatistics. Lots of grants affiliated with the Knight ADRC, including eight R01s. I won't go through each one in a matter of time, but it's an impressive number and a wide scientific points of view. Many different uh, aspects are being supported of, of, of uh, scientific inquiry are being supported by the Knight uh, ADRC, very, very broad. And uh, two uh, training awards, mentored uh, career development awards uh, to Brian Gordon and to Suzanne Sch Schindler. Uh, we have um, students and fellows from a wide range that come to us and we're pleased uh, this year to have um, four uh, summer students, uh, uh, two from um, uh, Washington University, current students in Washington University, uh, uh, Aaron and Tracy, and then Kristen is a St. Louis University graduate who's doing post-baccalaureate work in, at WashU. And uh, they're working with us as is a high school student, so Signigda, uh, working with uh, the clinical core. And I mentioned uh, Justin Long uh, several times. We also have uh, another student who's been doing a practicum with us, Mandy Fox, who's a gerontology student from the University of Missouri, St. Louis. This past year, we had 10 applications for three pilot grants. We, again, show the interdisciplinary range of the Knight ADRC, nine departments contributed those 10 applications, and those are the awardees, Celeste Karch, uh, Andrea Serrano, and Peter Wong. We are doing a number of collaborations. Remember, it's important to demonstrate this in the new application for the ADRC. Greg Day is our site leader for a study called Longitudinal Early Onset Alzheimer's Disease. This is not dominantly inherited Alzheimer's disease, but early onset without an apparent genetic uh, cause. And Greg will be enrolling 10 to 12 individuals from our Memory Diagnostic Center uh, group. We're working with uh, colleagues at the uh, Alzheimer's Disease Research Center at Emory University to share precious resources, including CSF uh, and blood. And uh, we're just developing a uh, performance site here at Washington University for a national program called Neurodegeneration and Aging Down Syndrome. We'll be working with the University of Pittsburgh, Wisconsin, and the University of Cambridge in England. Uh, Bo Ansis uh, will be the site PI, and the co-PI will be John uh, Constantino, who is the chair of the Department of, S of Child Psychiatry and co-director of the Intellectual and Developmental Disability Research Center here at Washington University. Uh, more collaborative applications. It appears we're going to be working with a number of other uh, Alzheimer's centers uh, under the leadership of Mike Weiner for online methods to predict cognitive decline. Another collaborative grant uh, uh, ran in some difficulty because Colin Masters is at Mel Melbourne, Australia, and uh, his review uh, had to be conducted in a, a, a fashion that uh, would not have been if he had been uh, representing an American institution. Uh, and then we are involved with uh, other groups that are looking at preclinical Alzheimer's disease in middle-aged people. Uh, as I mentioned, Joy Snyder is now organizing our clinical trials unit. We are participating in these current trials. I won't belabor them. And uh, some more trials. We just launched a new trial this month, the Trailblazer study, the last one on this calendar. This is for very mildly symptomatic people with Alzheimer's disease. And to my knowledge is the first trial to uh, evaluate a combination of two different drugs in the same individual. It'll be a, uh, it'll be a beta secretase inhibitor and an antibody to uh, amyloid beta in uh, amyloid plaque. 
And so the first screening visit just occurred, very mildly symptomatic individuals. We're very fortunate to have a number of partners here uh, that support and work with us in tonight ADRC. Uh, St. Louis chapter of the Alzheimer Association, very well represented here uh, today uh, with Adrian Holden and, uh, and uh, with uh, Carol Rodriguez uh, and, and perhaps some others. Uh, I'm going to um, pause for just a moment and um, I want all of you to join me in thanking uh, Carol. She's decided after 25 years longer to retire in August. She's sitting next to Dave Holtzman, so if you'll stand, Carol, let us show our appreciation. She's been a wonderful uh, colleague. Also wonderful colleagues are the individual members of our African American Advisory Board. Many are here today. I won't have them uh, stand, but I can tell you that uh, once, once it formed in, two, in the year 2000, it's been uh, very instrumental in helping us uh, as an ADRC try to become culturally competent and more welcoming to people of color. The Lynx Incorporated is very, similarly has been very supportive of us. The Harvey A. Friedman Center for Aging under the leadership of Nancy Morrow Howe. The Hope Center for Neurologic Disorders led by Dave Holtzman and um, our philanthropic support. We've really had been blessed with uh, 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 gifts from individuals, Barnes Jewish Hospital Foundation, uh, Tina Hissong representing the foundation, and Washington University. And um, we really have enjoyed, uh, uh, from Dave Holtzman to the Dean of the School of Medicine to the Chancellor of the University, remarkable institutional support. We thank our uh, colleagues at the Office of the Alum, uh, Alumni and Development uh, who have helped us with our many donors. I can't name them all, but certainly the Knights. Uh, Daniel Brennan, who provided the endowed professorship that now Bo Ansis holds. Roger and Paula Riney. Dave and Betty Farrell. Fred Simmons, Olga Mohan. The Coppolos I mentioned, the Poletskis I mentioned, and the Blumenfeld. So we're really blessed to have that. Here's our uh, African American Advisory Board. As I say, they help uh, try to uh, be, help us to try to become more culturally sensitive and competent and to encourage research particip participation by African Americans in the St. Louis community. They're, they are our ambassadors to that uh, African American community as leaders in, across a wide range of professions, education, clergy, community advocacy, and so forth. Current chair is Douglas Petty, and uh, seated here is the vice chair, uh, Reverend C. Jessel Strong. The individual members are, are listed here. Very appreciative of their, uh, uh, their efforts to try to uh, as assist us in our mission. Uh, the founding director of the African-American Advisory Board, Norman Say, he regrets he can't be with us today. Uh, but he began in 2000 as the chair. Uh, he experienced a stroke. Uh, fortunately, he recovered uh, very, very well from that, but he relinquished the chairmanship in 2006, uh, although he remains uh, a very uh, uh, active participant on the African American Advisory Board. And Murtis, you can tell Norman that I would say not only active, but vociferous. Right. Um, the third, so when he retired his chair, or stepped down his chair, we uh, launched an annual lecture in his honor. And the 13th annual Norman RSA lecture will be this coming October. And for the first time, we're going to have two SAY lectures. One is a psychiatric epidemiologist, Joy Ballsberry from Mayo Clinic. And the other is the NIA's director of special populations, Carl Hill. Here's Dr. Ballsberry. And here's Dr. Hill. The day following the uh, SAY lecture, we're going to have an all-day workshop here, this auditorium. It'll be national, you know, representatives from 31 Alzheimer's centers, the National Institute on Aging, the National Alzheimer's Association, certainly our Greater Missouri chapter. We were awarded a grant to be able to uh, uh, help uh, allay the travel costs of, of the key individuals and also the National Alzheimer's Association is making available 
junior investigator travel, travel awards as well. So we want to understand why it's important to include African Americans in Alzheimer's research, examine why they may not participate or what may help them participate, look at other centers and programs for what they are doing to, uh, to disseminate effective strategies, develop new strategies for a key element. And it's one thing to make our research volunteers more diverse, but we also have to make our faculty and staff more diverse. And so we're going to finally end the workshop with developing strategies that will lead to further grants to, that will help, uh, we'll, be, we'll be examining whether they help improve African American research participation. I, I won't go through the agenda, it's still, in, in, uh, still being developed. All right, so I'm coming to an end. Uh, I believe firmly that this is true. I, often don't like to say it because it sounds uh, boasting, but I'm <clears throat> happy to say that our Knight ADRC not only is a world leader, my opinion, it is unsurpassed with our outstanding faculty, including all of our early stage investigators and our trainees, our next generation. We have superb staff and highly committed participants. And we are very increasingly linked with our Memory Diagnostic Center and its extraordinarily dedicated staff. We're interdisciplinary and yet despite the multiple departments, divisions, we're cohesive, organized, and I like to think collegial. I tip my hat to Virginia and Krista. They both have scientific backgrounds uh, and so they appreciate the uh, research aspects, but they're remarkable executive uh, directors. I've been concerned, however, that uh, I mentioned how broad our portfolio of scientific projects is that we're supporting in the ADRC, and I wonder if we're becoming um, too diffuse. We're trying to do too many things. So I'm concerned about that. I've told you I'm concerned about participation, participant burden that leads to abnormally high amounts of missing data. And I'm concerned about our faculty who understandably will be recruited to other programs. When I am asked about if we have any people at the assistant professor level who might be candidates for positions elsewhere, I say no. <laughs> we do have some, but I couldn't possibly recommend them to, to anybody else. Oh, so I, I, I hope that we can continue to promote everyone's best career, whether it's here or not, but I hope that it is here. But inevitably, we'll have faculty recruited. Um, we. Um, as I said, are blessed by our philanthropic gifts from our, all of our supporters, but we need it. Only 70% of what we actually do in our research program is supported by the NIA grants. The other 30% is all from philanthropy. So we're grateful, but it's essential. And I mentioned, are we getting too diffuse, too fragmented in our scientific portfolio? And, and you know, there are pluses and minuses, and I'm just bringing this up because I'm going to be thinking about this and whether we need to uh, reconsider how broad our approach uh, has been. Uh, Joy Snyder is uh, almost certain to get a new T32 training grant that will allow us to increase our support and growth of junior faculty and postdocs. Uh, because this will be allowing us to do two postdoctoral fellows a year who are focused on Alzheimer's disease and related disorders. I've mentioned several times the clinical trials unit that Joy is leading, and uh, we've hired our first uh, individual to help with that. She's been a, a very welcome addition to the team, Sonia. But we're going to need more staff, more clinicians, and more space. 
I turned 70 in February. Uh, I am the principal investigator for the renewal of the HASD program project that went in in January and plan to uh, serve as the principal investigator of the ADRC renewal next year and the ACS renewal the following year. And I don't have a set time for when I will retire, but I will retire. I'm not going to work forever. Uh, and again, um, we all, me personally, but we all are very blessed that we have such talented and accomplished faculty that will be no problem whatsoever to transition the leadership of these grants to other individuals. We we'll already have done this with the uh, Diane Grant in 2015. Randy Bateman succeeded me as the principal investigator and no, no, not, a, not a step was, there was no misstep whatsoever with that. But I have some um, ideas in mind about who will replace me. One is my grandson, Jack. <laughs> so I plan to stay on a little bit longer to let his career development mature. <laughs> but now there's a, there's a rivalry because he's got a little brother. Aww. So maybe they'll be co-directors of the night ADRC. And with that, I'll stop and be happy to answer any questions. Thank you.